Welcome to another online worship gathering. We're so thankful that you have taken some time to be intentional about worshiping God and receiving his word in your home or wherever you are watching. Uh, We have been praying for you in this moment, whether this is a Saturday, Sunday, or another day in the week, no matter if you're on your cell phone, your tablet, or your TV screen, we believe that God is doing big things in our church, in your home, and in this community through these online worship gatherings. And we want this to be an intentional time of worship and God's word in your home. So go ahead and open up your Eternal Church app. And if you don't have that yet, just go to wherever you get your apps and search Eternal Church because inside of that app, today's message is going to feature worship lyrics so that you can sing out these songs in your home and proclaim the truth about who God is wherever you are. Now, while you're taking a minute to locate that, I wanted to let you know that your church leaders have been hard at work this week assessing the needs and the opportunities in the community through this time that we're in. And Pastor Don revealed this week that we have started a COVID relief effort. And that's coming from our church and it's gonna go out into the community. And we're so excited about the response that's already come in. So if you are in need, We want you to reach out, office at eternalchurch.net. We have deacons that are standing by, ready to get involved with you and to help you with whatever you need help with. If you are waiting to contribute and you're ready to find out how can you help meet the needs of the community, again, office at eternalchurch.net. We would love to talk with you about getting involved in this relief effort. Now, hopefully you found the worship lyrics by now. Let's take a minute to prepare our hearts as we get ready for this online worship gathering. In the New Testament, uh, Jesus told a series of stories that had kind of a similar plot to them. It started out with a landowner or a business owner, and he would turn his property and all the resources and authority to do his business over to some stewards, some managers. Then he went on a long journey. And at the end of that journey, he would come back and he would uh, deal with each of the servants according to whether or not they were faithful or unfaithful, just purposes during that absence. And uh, one, on, upon his return, in one of the incidents, he said some stirring words to one of his servants that was faithful. He said, enter into the joy of your master. You know, and that's stirring. But the real point of the story has to do with what happens in that long absence when things are happening where it's easy to lose a sense of the owner's purpose or the master's purpose in that. And uh, one of the applications we con- that for us in the church is that we're in this time of we're right in front of us or something is causing a lot of people to doubt and be insecure and not sure about things. But uh, God's word calls us to trust his purposes for the ups and the downs. And we can't really judge everything that's happening just by what's right in front of us. We need to look deeper. And this song we're going to sing together, it's called 10,000 Reasons. And one of the lines says, 10,000 reasons for my heart to find a reason to worship God. And um, so that's kind of the theme of this song. It's an invitation to faithfulness in the midst of uncertainty. And it's an invitation to to look beyond what's right in front of us and see God's good purposes behind it all. Sing together. Sing like me. 
time has come But still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand reasons for my heart to I love this next song we're going to sing because it's a great proclamation for us as a church right now to, um, to find our, our hope in Him and Him alone. Um, the scriptures say that, that we are living stones being built together as a spiritual house and Christ being the cornerstone. And so as we sing this next song, let it be uh, a way for us to just declare together as a church that our hope is found in Him and Him alone. Amen. Righteousness alone 
peace and we find hope and rest in, in the truth of, of what we're singing and saying and um, one day every knee is going to bow and, and every tongue is going to confess those truths that, that we're singing now and um, so let's, uh, let's declare that together as we sing How Great Is Our God.
declare that in our families, in our homes now, that you're great, you're worthy of our praise. That one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that you're Lord to the glory of God the Father. We love you. We worship you now. We just pray that you would open our ears to to hear your word, soften our hearts to receive, to, to be moldable and pliable. Um, speak to us now, in Jesus' name, amen. So church, it's great to be with you again. Uh, thank you, Sean, Brother Sean Robinson, for uh, blessing us with a word from God uh, through you to us last week. Uh, many have expressed their gratitude and growth because of your insight from the book of Zechariah. Uh, we come now to our final uh, minor prophet, lucky number 12, the great Italian prophet Malachi. Uh, hopefully you giggled. I can't see you nor hear you. Uh, but we come today to the end of our series, Malachi, a name in Hebrew that means my messenger. And we're going to just, uh, we're going to see together just how appropriate that name is in just a bit. It's a short book uh, four chapters, just 53 verses. It's easy to comprehend. And uh, let me share some quick context with you. Malachi lived about 100 years after the Israelites have returned from exile. So another pre-exilic um, prophet. Uh, his message was to the people of God who had been living back in Jerusalem for some time now. The temple had been rebuilt now for at least two generations. Uh, you will remember the the historical rebuilding account you can find in Ezra and in Nehemiah. Uh, those prophets uh, had promised a return to presence and glory. By the way, the prophetic accounts you can find in Haggai and Zechariah. But this is what they pictured, those prophets, that there would be a return, that, that, that this uh, temple, once it was, uh, was built, would usher in a new kingdom of, of prosperity and peace for the Israelites, and the worship of Yahweh would be at the center of all human existence. Uh, that was their hope, that all of the nations would come and bow their knee to the God of Israel. But now, 60 years later, two generations later, that's not at all what's happening. We find out that the Israelites who have repopulated the city have proved, to, have proved to be just as broken and just as unfaithful to God as their ancestors. And that waywardness had resulted once again in rampant inequality and poverty, injustice, and distance with God. It is in this book of Malachi that we find out just how corrupt this new generation had become. Except, and here's the key to the book, they, they don't know it. And so the prophet allows us to kind of listen in to a series of hypothetical conversations between Yahweh and his covenant people. And by doing so, that allows us, in a non-threatening way, to discover that our relationship with God and our response to his love is very much like the Israelites. Our excuses and our denials sound very similar to their own. And so it's a readily accessible, relevant, uh, lots of great relevant content, and it permeates throughout this book. And therefore, the big, idea, the big idea of Malachi, and I think I can safely say that it's at least one, if not one of the major, maybe even the most major big idea of all of the minor prophets and the major prophets, is this one. Our love and our desire for God can be measured by how seriously we deal with the sin in our lives. I just want to say that again. Our love and our desire for God can be measured by how seriously we deal with our sin inside of our lives. Every prophet says, every prophet is going to say something like this. Let me make the case. Let me awaken you to sin. Let me call you and show you exactly how bad it is. And then after they do that, they say, and now you have an opportunity to repent. Once you have been awakened, you have an opportunity to repent, to change, to bend back, to metanoia in the New Testament, which means to change our thinking. In the Old Testament, I like the word even better, teshuva. It means to return, to come back, to get back on track with me. And by the way, repentance is required for salvation. It's required for justification. It's required for sanctification. It's a way that we learn to do our lives as Christians. And this is how much we've messed up this term in evangelical churches and circles for the last 60 years. 
I think it's gotten a really negative connotation. Nobody wants to hear the word repent right now with a virus. And it's something that preachers of old would say to congregations to shock and awe those people. And maybe it's good like medicine. In other words, it's kind of a once-off medicine that you take, you do it once, and you'll be healed. But that's not at all a biblical view. These prophets are almost always, all of them, major and minor, are almost always speaking to God's people, the people he has covenant with. And they're saying, repent, teshuva, come back home. The very first sermon that Jesus preached, in it, in Mark, he included the word, repent, metanoia. Change your thinking, religious people, for the kingdom of God is different than what you think. It's here and you don't know it. So it's the way in, it's the way through, and it has nothing to do, by the way, with beating yourself up or flogging your ego or feeling like a terrible person. That's another misconception. Instead, think of repentance like this, and I'm grateful for uh, J.I. Packer for this helpful definition. Repentance is turning from all that you know of sin with all that you know of yourself to all that you know of God. And you can see how that definition keeps growing with the maturing person. Because as I grow, I become more and more aware of and uh, aware of my deeper sin as well. And as I grow to understand my own nature more and more, I also realize things about myself, things that I come through by nature or through my family or through my culture, uh, things that I, I know that my wife or spouse or kids don't even know about the inner workings of my heart. And the Bible says that as I grow in those knowledges, I keep turning from all of that to a God that I know more deeply and more intimately and more fully than I did months ago or years ago. Because that is at the very heart of God. Not a one-off, God, I'm really sorry, that leaves us unchanged and weary and fearful of our final days. But instead, he wants us to become remade through a process of continual repentance into a person who looks more and more like the one we are in love with and more and increasingly confident, therefore, in our secure salvation. So I know as a pastor, and I see this all the time when I preach, that there are people who are soft, soft with God right now. They're pliable, they're grateful, they're understanding, they cry during sermons, they laugh harder during sermons. And for that person, a message of repentance is like deer to water. In fact, people who are growing want to know more about the sinfulness of sin. They want to know more about themselves than they have been able to deduce through mere introspection. And they want to know more about God than they have ever meditated upon. Because they love God so much, and they know that love for God is proportionately equivalent with repentance. So they want to know more about all of it. It is the person, the one who is in the worst position with God, who pulls the spiritual Gary Coleman from different strokes and says incredulously, what you talking about, Willis? Huh? What? Not true. Who said? I don't think that's true. You see, friends, resistance to repentance is in itself the greatest proof of the need for repentance. Because it means when you are resisting, it means you must be dumb to sin. By the way, that's a great biblical word. Oblivious to, uh, unaware of. Dumb to sin, dumb to your own nature, and dumb to the one holy and one perfect God of the universe. And that's a, a person you, it's difficult to be a friend with, difficult to be married to, and it's a recipe of destruction with our God. So Malachi first, what he does is he makes charges against Israel. I'm going to put all of the charges in two simple buckets for you, and we're going to look at a couple of scriptures. We're not going to spend a lot of time on them, but I do want to mention these buckets so you can pull these buckets back out with your, 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 your small group or your, your friends or your spouse, and you can look at these buckets again. All of the things that Malachi mentions, I think, go in these two buckets. Here's the first bucket of sin. Half-hearted devotion. When the Israelites returned from exile... Historians tell us that they would never again lose their devotion to external ceremonies. They had done that before, but not anymore, to this day, actually. They became hyper-religious, 
thinking that the reason that God had punished them and sent them away is because they hadn't ticked all of the boxes with God. So they became very sensitive to external forms of devotion. They made sure to keep them. By the way, this was the time in Israel's history during the Second Temple time where we hear about Pharisees. They become a thing. Sadducees become a thing. The ones that Jesus later called whitewashed tombs. And so this is how Malachi makes his case about their half-hearted devotion. Two ways. He says, first, look at your sacrificial offerings. Chapter 1, verse 13, says this. But you say, what a weariness this is, and you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts, speaking of sacrifices. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering. And then God says, for I am a great God. And what he is insinuating is, if I'm a great God in your heart, then why am I not getting your greatest offerings? Their sacrifices, we should remember, were consistent, they were regular, they were frequent, but they were without heart. They gave God their leftovers, lame, blind, crippled, stolen animals, the very least that they could give and still never be accused of not giving. Malachi, Malachi also sees this. He says, not only in your offerings, sacrificial offerings of animals, but in your offerings of tithes, money. He says, chapter 3, verse 8, will man rob God? Here's the questioning that I love in Malachi. Yet you are robbing me, but you say, how have we robbed you, God? And then he says, in your tithes and contributions. And what had happened in their day is people were supposed to bring a tithe. A tithe is a simple word in Hebrew that means 10%. And they were supposed to bring their treasure, their 10% of their treasure, to the treasure house, the Bible says. And that storehouse would flow into the impoverished community. That's what it was there for. So the church could manage it to those that needed it. Well, 10% became 9%, 9% became 7%, which became 5%, which became 3%. During the Great Depression in the United States, the average offering to church from everybody who attended was 3.3%. 3.3%. Today, it's 2.5%. Now, some of you may say, well, uh, back then they didn't have all of the charitable organizations. And I give a lot of money to different organizations that, are, that, that do good work, parachurch ministries, missionaries. That's why I don't give as much to church. Which, by the way, you should know I'd be fine with that. I don't think the Bible says that you have to give your 10% to the local church. But it's not true because charitable giving is actually a little less than 2.5%. And that's if the same person gives both places. So what the issue is in our culture right now, it's not that we don't give enough to church or we don't give enough to healthy parachurch organizations or mission organizations. We just don't give enough. And we call it being a little stingy. Or sometimes we say, oh, we're just not quite generous like we want to be. God calls it robbery, a word that's so strong, it's only used six times in the Old Testament. It means plunder, it means destroy. It means to come behind something that's beautiful and rip it away and kill it. And this is why, now let's bring both of these things together, sacrificial offerings and our tithes and contributions. The reason why it was so incredibly ugly and evil before God is because it refuses to acknowledge that anything and everything we have is a gift from God himself. The Bible is filled with scriptures that tell us that everything on heaven and earth, everything in the world, in the cosmos, in the universe belongs to the Lord. In 1 Chronicles 29, David, as he was trying to build the temple and he gave everything, he said uh, that everything comes from God and they could only at most, simply give back to God what has come from his hand. So even a 100% gift back to God of yourself and your money and all of that, that you have is simply giving God back what God had already given to you. And I don't, I, you know, listen, I know we don't like this in Western culture. We don't want to talk about it. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, Pastor Don. I have worked very hard for what I have. Why would I just give it away? I've worked very hard. Well, okay. I want to remind you that you have worked very hard with the abilities, the opportunities, the circumstances, the intelligence, and the health that God has provided you by his grace. You're not where you are because of hard work. That's a lie. 
because if God had decided to create you in the womb of a woman where you would be, uh, be, uh, come, you know, be delivered from a woman on a hillside in Mongolia in the 11th century, you wouldn't be doing so well, would you? No matter how hard you have worked, God has given you everything you have. Now your participation in it, however small a contribution it has been, was intended to give you pleasure and joy to be working with God, not to become an entitled owner of what you have. So if you have more than others, the Bible says it is because God intended for you to plow and plant it into the lives of others. You're not an owner of your goods. In the Old Testament, now we're talking largely about money and animals, but the Bible says everything you have is so that you could be a steward of it. Imagine if a money manager today takes money from a client and he invests it somewhere for that client who's given him the money. And that money makes two to three times over its worth. And the money manager gets excited because he or she is participating in the process of investing and blessing. And they get excited for the client. But remember, the money manager is investing in line with the directions, the purposes, the desires, and the values of the investor. If the money manager doesn't, if the money manager goes his or her own way, if the money manager takes the money for himself or herself, strays in any way, confuses the role between manager and owner, you know what they call it? Fraud. God calls it robbery. Everything we have has been given to us to manage well, to invest, to multiply it so as to bless the community. And when that doesn't happen, and it clearly isn't happening in our world today, and it wasn't happening then because they were not even willing to give good animals to God. They weren't willing to give a tenth to God. So obviously we know how they feel about the whole deal. God calls spiritual fraud robbery. It's destruction at the throne of God. It's spitting on his pleasure. Friends, when people are rushing to the store right now and hoarding all kinds of supplies and, and, and toilet paper and cleaners and hand sanitizers, it is not because they actually think those things will save them. It is because in times of emergency, who people already are becomes heightened. Our natural inclinations become even stronger. If we have lived our lives for ourselves then we will live it even more in times of emergency. The empty toilet paper shelves allow us to see our culture for what it is. Now, the second bucket that God talks about is broken covenants. So we have one bucket that says, you know, this half-hearted devotion. And now we move to the second bucket where he says, another issue is your broken covenants. In chapter two, Malachi calls out God's people for breaking the marriage covenant. Uh, what was happening then is the men of Israel were taking girlfriends um, because they could. Uh, the women didn't have any rights. It would be the same way today if the women had no rights. They, they, they cheated on their wives. And if the women did that in their culture, the women would have been killed, stoned to death. But the men could do it. And you can read about that in chapter 2, verses 10 through 16. And they could get away with it. And then, after they got comfortable with that situation, they would actually divorce the, their, their first wives, or the wives of their youth, the Bible calls it, and they would become married to the foreign wives. And God says, I hate that. I hate it. Now, why? Because the marriage covenant was intended to reflect God's covenant with his people, which means that the, the covenant is never about our needs. It was always about reflecting and proclaiming the covenant that God will keep with his people. That's what Hosea was about, right? Do you remember that story? God says, you must keep the covenant with her because you must see how much I love you and will not break my covenant with you. By the way, Paul makes the same case about marriage in Ephesians chapter 5. And by the way, church, you should know we like to talk about covenant at eternal. We're going to continue to talk about it because we think that all of our covenants as Christians are intended to reflect God's covenant with his people. For better or for worse, richer or poor, sickness and in health. We do that with our friendships, we do that with our marriages, and we should do that with one another. Now, a covenant is not a promise to do something or to be somebody if the other person does something or becomes somebody. A godly covenant 
is a promise to be somebody now and in the future regardless of the other. And earthly covenants should reflect the great one that God keeps with his children, his bride. I've heard people say, hey, I don't like the word covenant for membership to a local body. And I'll say, well, why? Well, well, I just, I'm concerned. What if, what if leadership gets sideways? I mean, what if the pastor fails? We hear about that all the time. Pastors fail. They take a girlfriend. They, 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 they commit fraud on the church, right? What if there's a sin somewhere in the leadership? And here's what I always want to say, and I'll just go ahead and say, go ahead and say it now. First of all, well, welcome to covenant. It's dangerous. But secondly, notice this. No one has ever pulled me aside and said, I don't think covenant membership is wise, and I ask why not, and they say this. Because if I place membership with this body, I am going to consume way more than I contribute. By the way, I like to complain a lot. And I'll probably never send a note of encouragement to leadership. And I'm pretty aware of my sin nature. Sin nature. So I will attend worship, I'll listen to ser sermons, but likely I'll never change. And I don't like to tithe. I don't even agree, agree with tithing to the church. And I have a dysfunctional family. And we have lots of needs. So I'm sure those resources of the church are going to need to flow my way. And in the end, I'll probably leave at the slightest inclination when things aren't going my way. By the way, I'm going to listen to five other sermon podcasts this week. And I'll send you links so you can learn. I'm, I'm not going to volunteer to teach our children. I'll take, I'll take, and I'll take. So are you sure that it's wise to covenant with me? Never heard that, not once. <laughs> Why? Because a sign of a wicked people is in their inability to make and keep covenants. So church membership becomes simply church attendance. You can come and go when you want. Marriage is commodified. When it's no longer fulfilling, you have a right to leave. And that's the issue. You wanna know the issue? It's because you thought it was about you. Listen to these two verses. Chapter 2, verse 17. Malachi says, and he's pointing to why they're unable to, to keep their covenants. You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is, go is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where's the God of justice? Chapter 3, verse 14. You have said, it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking and mourning before the Lord of hosts? Do you see the commodification of faith? Do you see how it's become transactional in their, in their eyes? They were asking this simple question about covenant. Is it going to work for me? Does it benefit me to be good, to do good? I'm not so sure it matters. How short-sighted and how incredibly selfish. No one is talking about the fact that it is of no benefit to God whatsoever for him to love us, to be patient, to be long-suffering. And it costs him everything, and, he give, and we give him nothing. He loves, he loves, he loves, and we disobey, and we run, and we consider other choices, and we drift, and we choose our own way, and we rebel, and we return, and we're sorry, and we drift, and we disobey, and he loves, and he loves, and he loves. How dare we look at God and question if the covenant is working out for us? So, what needs to happen? What's the answer for Israel? What's the answer for her consistent unfaithfulness? Well, the entire Old Testament can be summarized in two Malachi verses. Chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. You see that? Because of who I am, you're okay. From the days of your fathers, but see, they're not okay. You have turned aside from my statutes, and you have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. From the very beginning, Adam, Eve, Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, David, God has not moved. He is the unchanging, faithful one, but we keep moving from him. Now, if that is true, and it doesn't matter if you believe it, it is, that's the truth, then what will God do? What can he do? How can he help people that won't stay with him? Is the issue that we need, they need another prophet? 
right? Have they had enough prophets? Maybe the next one will work. Is that the issue? Oh, maybe they need another king, another good king. That will certainly do it. Will that work? Another sermon. If it's the next sermon, then I'll really get it. Maybe they need another Ezra, another Nehemiah, great leaders who resolve people to the Lord. Is that it? Well, they had that. What about a covenant? It's a, it's, the covenant's bad. Let's get covenant 2.0 in the house. Another word from God, that's what we need. Another punishment. I know what God needs to do. He needs to send another plague, more earthquakes, more pestilence, more disease, more another diaspora event. Separate us again. Like, what is God to do? What needs to happen for you to stop drifting from God? What needs to happen for you to begin to cling to him, to give our lives away, to give our resources to those in need, and to keep our covenants. What does God have to do for you to be the kind of person he hopes you will be? The Bible says that the problem is not that you are not trying hard enough. It's not that you are insincere in your resolutions. The Bible says this isn't about trying harder at all. The issue, the Bible says, is that we are born with wicked hearts that no promise nor resolution on our part can eradicate. From the days of our father, we are doomed to fail, the Bible says. As God was etching a promise on stone, his people were crafting a golden calf below. In 2 Samuel 7, Nathan gives a word to David that God had appointed him as ruler over Israel and that he would make his name great and make a house of David that would stand forever. Oh my goodness, great words before the month was out. David was in bed with Bathsheba and murdering his dear friend. This is not a God problem. It's a you problem and it's a me problem. The only thing that can help us would have to be something that could change us from within. Not a new law, but new life. Not reform, but rebirth. The last word of chapter four, the last word of the entire Old Testament, think about this, the last, you can check it yourself right now in your Bible, the last word of the entire Old Testament is this word, destruction. The Hebrew word for that word is curse. The last word. God began this story with creation and order and beauty and, and, and birth. And the story ends with the word curse. And that was the entire completed story for God's people for over 400 years from creation to curse. And God could have, should have, put a period right there forever. He's done enough. He's done all he can. We've chosen our own way, what else can he do? He's tried everything he can do to bring us to his heart, period. It's done, but he didn't. The next, word, the next words actually continue, and they come from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The answer to our problem was always going to require not more from us, the ones who drift, but incredulously more from God the one who's faithful. Malachi spoke of it in chapter four, but he had no idea what it would look like. God's son picked up that word curse, picked up the idea of curse, and became our curse, the Bible says, so that finally we could be set free. Jesus, by the way, when he was on earth, he was walking around. What was he doing? He was, he was healing a blind person, a lame person, touching a diseased person, right? They, they can hear now. They can see now. The, the, their limbs are healed. He's, what's he doing? He's reversing the curse of humanity. But he knew that the root of the curse was not in the external brokenness of humanity, but it was living within each of us. And that's why he needed to do more. We don't need a resolution. We need rebirth. Jesus, the Bible tells us in no uncertain certain terms that Jesus lived the life we couldn't live so that we could be rewarded with the life that we couldn't earn. Jesus, God's son, who came to put all of the priests out of business, who came to put all of the temples out of business, who came to put all of the resolutions out of business. Resolution? Church, do you think you need another resolution with God? The resolution has been kept for you. It's available. 
his perfect and pleasing life that satisfied the covenant with God and also paid the penalty for our broken covenant is available to you right now. That substitute, the Bible says, will come inside your life through the Holy Spirit and it will finally change your heart, not all at once, but it is possible now to finally be transformed. We do that through substitution and by holding on to faith that Jesus has done something we could not, but we also do it by accepting an, an invitation and an acceptance of a real power that's going to come into our lives and purify us from within. And so the prophet Malachi has spoken. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for Malachi. Thank you for his heart for his people. Thank you for the things that he saw that he never realized in his own life. That he only was left with the curse of his people and only got a glimpse of something else that might be available someday, but never was realized by him and by thousands and thousands of others who walked with him. We on the other side of the cross are so blessed because we see the answer that you have given us to the problem that we couldn't fix. The only fix for our hearts was not somebody who came and gave us yet another law so that we could make another resolution that we could break, but gave us a substitution life so that we could take it on ourselves and hide in it and a life that was promised to come inside as well and begin to work on us from the inside out. We're so thankful for that. And we pray that for our people today. It's in your name I pray, amen.
no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. The very body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declares the Dear Father, we just thank you for this time we've had again to worship, to gather together in our different spaces and to see you and hear from you and sing to you. Hallelujah, Father. We do come to you uh, with hope now. There is a hope beyond ourselves. You have made a way for us. You have uh, cleaned us by your presence that's available through the death and the sacrifice and the substitution of your son. And we hold on to that now. We have hope, not just for today, but for tomorrow. We can be transformed, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us to take that in, realize it, and claim it as our own today. Thank you for our time together. Uh, it's in your name we pray. Amen.